Would you grab your seat for just a few moments? We've got to celebrate uh, one that has come to be baptized in the waters and, and just declare their public profession of faith this morning. So will we turn our attention to the screen? You know, it's always a blessing to continue to get, come before you. I mean, I think we're close to 100 baptisms since January. Isn't that great? I mean, that just means God's just doing some amazing, amazing things here at Bear Creek. And we're just thrilled to be a part of that. And I hope that you're soaking that in. This, this, this doesn't happen at other places. So I just want you to just realize that, that God has got some really great things going on in, in and among our, our community of faith here. So this is Connor Scott. Connor came this morning to share with you his testimony. Connor, tell everybody, what's your testimony of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. It's great. Based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried alongside Christ, raised to walk in a brand new life. Oh my goodness, what a joy it is to continue to just see people getting baptized week after week. And, and Peyton has come this morning just wanting people to know that, uh, that she's come to that realization and an understanding of what baptism's about, why we do this. And it's something that we need to continue to put into our heart and into our life and share with other people about what Jesus Christ is doing in our life. That's our testimony. Don't be ashamed of that. It's something that we need to proclaim publicly in front of our, our faith family. So Peyton Stewart, tell everybody what is your testimony of faith? Amen. Based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried alongside Christ. Thanks for walking again. Really exciting way to start our service. You know, in just the last couple of weeks, we've been able to see 13 people follow the Lord in baptism and express their faith and share that with us. And. Um, you know, it never gets old, never gets old watching that. And just, I hope for you, if you're a Christ follower, it just does something in your heart and your life. Thinking back to that time when you prayed to receive Christ and how much joy you have knowing that Jesus has come into your heart and he's changed your life. And as you're following him, what a blessing it is to have a personal relationship with the God who sits in heaven and is in control of everything. And yet he's personally related and connected to you. I know that means a lot to me. Listen, do, if we have any family in here that we're, um, we're celebrating with us, we just want to welcome you. We're glad you're here. And if you're our guest today, we want to welcome you home. We hope you just sit back and feel like this is a place to relax and feel like it's home as we worship God together. And to all our members and our regular attenders, would you just welcome all of them for me real quick? So listen, as, we, uh, as we're celebrating this time, maybe you as watching this uh, young lady being baptized, maybe you thought, you know what, I've never done that, but I would like to. I'm interested in that and what that means and taking my next step and sharing my faith. So if you've never been baptized like that, be sure and let us know. We'd love to visit with you and talk to you about taking your next step of growing in your faith and sharing your faith and following Christ. You know, what you witnessed there, it's exactly what Jesus did in the Bible. He went to John the Baptist and he didn't have to do it, but he did it to set an example for us of what it looks like to follow him and to be saved by him and be fully forgiven by him. And so if you're interested in that, stop by our information desk or one of our prayer stations at the back of the room at the end of the service. We'd love to visit with you. Also, as our guest, we've got a gift for you at our information desk. So as you came in, you received a bulletin or a worship guide inside there. There's a, uh, a welcome home card. Just fill that out, drop it by the information desk, and we'd love to give you a gift and just say thanks for being here. Um, it's a really cool gift, and you can fill that gift up with some coffee from our coffee shop next week. So be sure and stop by there. Um, you know the most popular place, there may be a larger crowd at the coffee shop right now than there is in this room. Now they're all coming. They're coming with their coffee though. So, um, hey, every single week, you know it takes a lot of volunteers to make this church run and operate, to take care of our kids and serve in student ministry and children's ministry. In fact, as we're entering into the fall and we're ramping up, do you know it takes 400 volunteers every Sunday morning? to make church work. And I look across this room and every one of you are gifted and have talents and abilities. And I'm telling you, it is such a joy to find your place and to serve within the church. In fact, that's what God has called us to. God, for everyone who accepts Christ, he gives you gifts. He gives you an ability. 
um, and a place to serve. And those gifts are intended to serve or to build up the church, to care for one another. So if you don't have a place to serve, we're still in need of about 100 volunteers as we enter in towards the end of August and head back to school and all of our ministries ramp up. And so stop by the, uh, the new leader booth in the lobby. You're not making a commitment when you go there. You're just saying, hey, I'd like to learn more. You can also find in that worship guide a sheet of paper that you can check off. You know what? I'd like to know more about this, this, or this. And you can, you can take that to that booth and uh, somebody will follow up with you. But um, listen, every one of you can make a difference. Now, as we, uh, as we get ready to continue worshiping with our giving, I want to just share with you as... Having the privilege to serve as the executive pastor here, one of the things that I oversee is all the administration and the finances of the church. And so you'll notice as we're at this time of year, our giving for the summer, our needs since the beginning of June till now is 630,000 and we've given 495. And so as of today, and that is, that's great. But I will tell you that shortfall of 135, this is not a want to or we hope for. Those are real needs. And so where we're at is how we bridge that gap is we are, have been dipping into our reserve funds, but those reserve funds only go so far. So I just want to encourage you, as a church, we only spend what collectively we as a faith family give together. There isn't money that comes from any place else. It comes from you. It comes from me. And so as we get ready to give, I want to talk about why do we give? Well, we give because God loved us and out of his love for us, we want to be faithful to him. We want to obey what he says in the Bible, and we want to give back. I know a long time ago, I learned about giving from my parents. And I'd go to my Sunday school class, and they'd hand me a little quarter. And I'd go there, and I'd turn my offering in. And as I got older, I kept being reminded of how important it is for me to give because God has given so much to me. And so... As you grow in your giving, I can tell you it brings you such great joy. Why do you give? Out of obedience, but also it strengthens your relationship with God and it allows us to be a part of everything that goes on. As we give, God promises to bless us. Now, that blessing may not be with things or more money. It just may be our relationship with him grows that much stronger. Our joy grows that much more by being a part of the church. What do we give to? You know, when you give, it's helping to provide for those Bible studies right now upstairs with our children. It helps send those kids and those students to camp over the summer. It's helped provide for all the mission trips. It's helped provide for those 10 VBSs in Cuba that we sent money for and we provided resources for. It helps both away and it helps us right here. We sit in a comfortable room. Air conditioner is running, just like at home. The bills come in and we pay them. But here's where we're at. If our giving doesn't increase, then as we head into the fall, we'll start looking at how we reduce our expenses in order to match up to what our giving is because we operate on a balanced budget. What comes in is what we spend. So if we're, we can only dip into our reserves for so long. So as you give, I pray you do it with joy. I pray you know you're making a difference. And I want you to know there's different ways you can give. You can give right now as we pass the plates. You can use an offering, um, um, offering envelope. You can give online using your mobile device. Or if you're like me, it's built into my budget. And once a month, it's auto deducted and I have it set up online. And so every time we give in church, I worship through giving knowing that I've given. And it's just a part of the way I live. However you choose to do it, it's just that you're being faithful, that you have a system in place, that you've determined an amount, and that it's you being faithful to God and what he's called you to give and that you have joy as you do it. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward because this is a time where we worship through our giving. Whether you do it right now or you know you've already done it like me, but that it's a worshipful moment. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. God, you have provided for us, and we know you'll continue to provide. And God, whatever it is, God, we're going to be faithful to use those resources to share the gospel, to make disciples, whether it's here within our own church, in our own community, in our own city, or whether it's in other parts of the world. God, as a church, we want to worship you now. We love you. And God, after we give, God, may our hearts be full of joy, knowing that through 
our faithfulness and your faithfulness to us that we get to be a part of seeing lives changed each and every single week, each and every Sunday. And God, what a blessing it is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. After you've given, please feel free to stand and join us in the song.
sing these words we're telling God God you are our king you're in control we're lifting the name of Jesus higher than what we're facing than what our problems are 
and what our sickness is and what's bringing us down. We're saying, God, you're above that. Your name is greater. Your name is higher. And we're saying, God, maybe I don't know how to control the things around me, but you are my king. You control everything. You're sovereign. You're perfect in all your ways. And I trust you. That's what we mean when we say, Christ, our King, be enthroned, be lifted high. It's us putting our faith and our trust in Jesus, our King. So would you do that this morning? Would you say, God, I trust you. God, you're my King. Be lifted high. Sing that with me again. Sing. We sing Christ, our King. Be enthroned, be lifted high. Be enthroned, be lifted high. We sing Christ our King, be forever glorified. Let's sing it again. We sing Christ my King. Oh Christ our King, be enthroned, be enthroned, be lifted up. You are our King. We sing Christ. Pray with me. So God, we do trust you. We do say that you are our king, God, that you are in control, that you know best for us, Lord. And this is why we put and we place our full trust in you, Jesus. Remind us, God, that you have everything under your care. Remind us, Lord, that you care for us. Remind us that you are sovereign, that everything happens because of you and for you, Lord. I pray, God, that today we would grow in the knowledge of who you are and that it would give us a reminder that we can trust you. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. King Jesus, we love you. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Why don't you give God a big round of applause this morning. And you can also be seated. I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning, and I hope that you are, uh, like me, just so excited to have the opportunity to come together and to worship. What an amazing, amazing opportunity that is. And so I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful that you're here with us this morning. If we've never had the opportunity uh, to meet, my name is Garrett Sims, and my wife, Allison, and I have the amazing privilege of working with our high schoolers and high school ministry here at Bear Creek. So we get to work with ninth through 12th graders, and, uh, and God is doing some amazing things, not only in that, in that ministry, but just across our church. And so I'm grateful to have the opportunity uh, to worship with you this morning, to open the word uh, together. If you have your Bible with me, would you open with me to John chapter 4? John chapter 4. Uh, John chapter 4 is a, is a well-known story. It's a story uh, titled The Woman at the Well. And, uh, but I think there's a lot of things that we can gather from this story uh, this morning. Have you ever seen one of those, uh, those TV shows uh, that it, it starts with a flashback? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, you're so excited, you, you've waited all week uh, to watch your TV show. You sit down in front of the TV, you turn it on, and, and all of a sudden the main character, the person that you're invested in, right, they're like running across the screen, uh, a suspenseful music is playing, uh, like they look over their shoulder and, and, and there's, there's somebody behind them that's chasing them and, and they're breathing heavy and you're like, what, what is going on? <laughs> what, did I just, what did I just fall into? Like, what, what's, what's happening? And, and, and all of a sudden, it's it's really suspenseful. You're like on the edge of your seat. The suspense is killing. You're like, what's going to happen? What is going on? And all of a sudden, the screen just cuts. And it goes to another screen. And it says, three days earlier. And you're like, ah, oh, now i got to watch the whole episode to figure out what is going on. Right? Like it builds that suspense in you. Like you're, you're hooked. You're ready to find out uh, what is going on in this episode. And it jumps you back to three days before. And it's going to tell you what led up to that moment. Right? That's, I, I want to take a different approach this morning. I want to I take the flashback approach to our sermon this morning. And so we're going to start with the end. We're going to start with the results. What is happening? And then we're going to ask ourselves this question, how did we get there? How did we get there? So if you're in John chapter 4, if you don't have your scriptures with you, that's okay. It's up on the screen. I'd love for you to follow along with me. We're going to start in verse 39. Verse 39. Then we're going we're gonna to read the end of the story. I want you to see where we are. I want you to see the excitement 
and then I want to figure out how we got there. Here we go. Verse 39 says this. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him, him being Jesus. So from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I had done. That's what she said. That's her testimony. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. Now there was a point to us starting there. The point is, is we're to ask ourselves, what in the world is going on? The first, pass, the first verse that we read it says, many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus. Man, we just jumped into the story into the middle of revival. This city is being changed. People are coming to know Jesus, and their lives are being changed. What an incredible thing that's happening here. So one has to ask this question, how did we get here? What led us to this moment? Okay, let's flash back now. Verse 1. We're going to jump back to verse 1. We're going to work our way to the end of the story. And we're going to answer this question. So if you still got your Bibles open with me, uh, let's jump to verse 1. It says this. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and in parentheses it says, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay, so we pick up the story here. The Bible says that Jesus is at work. Lives are being changed. The Bible says that he's baptizing lots of people, and he realizes he gets this call from the Lord that's telling him it's time to move. It's time to move. It's time to move to the next assignment. And so he's going to end up going to Galilee, but before he does, he's going to pass through the city of Samaria. Now, the point of that is he's got a divine interaction and a divine appointment that he's got to make in Samaria. He doesn't know this at the moment, but he just knows that he's got to go through the city of Samaria. But I, I want to bring our attention to something for just a moment. Before we continue on, do you notice there, uh, you know that the Bible, there, the Bible never does anything by accident. Every word in Scripture is important. There's a purpose behind it. So as I was reading, I thought this, was, this, this just stuck out to me. The Bible says that Jesus was uh, making and baptizing more disciples than John. And then, and then John feels it necessary to include this portion of Scripture, this, this statement. Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So I was studying, I was like, wait, 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 why is that important? Why, why does John feel the need to tell everybody Hey, Jesus is baptizing, but although Jesus is not the one actually baptizing, the disciples are. I think it's important for a couple of reasons, uh, but, but one that I want us to, to focus in on today, I think, I think one of the reasons that that's important is because John is showing that Jesus empowered his disciples and he expected them to participate in the work of the ministry. So, so I mean, this is, this is huge, right? How easy, I mean, this is Jesus, Jesus is over here praying and worshiping and teaching and preaching and making disciples, right? How easy would it have been for Jesus just to finish the pathway and baptize all of these people himself? But no, no, no. Jesus steps back and he says, okay, listen, it's your turn. You step up and you baptize. He was empowering his disciples and he was expecting them to play a part in the ministry Work. Now, I think that's important because I want you to understand something. 2,000 years later, those expectations have changed. God still empowers his people through gifts of the Holy Spirit that he gives to us, and then he expects us to exercise those gifts as we participate together in the ministry work. And so for some of you, maybe that's, that's what God has to show you this morning. Maybe, maybe that's the message for you this morning. That, you know what? I, 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 it's time for me to get off of the sidelines and get into the game. It's time for me to find a place that I can serve and I can participate. Listen, in your bulletins this morning, you've got a sheet that says, I want to learn more about service opportunities. I want to learn more about volunteering. 
you just fill that out and you take that out to uh, the desk in the lobby. And we would love to talk with you about that. Listen, there's, there's a place for every person to serve, to utilize the gifts that God has given you. Listen, you, you want to serve with, with preschoolers? Hey, we've got a place for you. If dealing with three-year-olds for two hours is not much your thing, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we got a place for you too. It takes a special person to, to, to deal with three-year-olds for two hours, all right? I get it. I get it. <laughs> We've got a place for everybody. But the truth of the matter is this. God's empowered us with gifts to serve the body of Christ. And he expects us to exercise those gifts. He's desiring for all of us to play a part in the work of the ministry. Okay, we've got to keep moving. That was not really, that was just extra. So, but it leads us to the big idea this morning. It leads us to the big idea. And this is the one thing that I want us to take away from today. Here's our big idea, our main idea is this. Through his, being Jesus, through his gift of grace and forgiveness, God invites you to be a part of his redemption story. Man, I hope, I hope that by the end of today, you grasp that and you understand God is inviting you to play a part in his story. Now, let's, let's be clear for a moment. This is God's story. This is not Garrett's story. This is not your story. God is the main character of this story. It is about him. But he is inviting you to play a small part in a much larger story. And what joy comes from that? What joy comes from fulfilling our calling and being a part of God's work? So that's our big idea. That almost to come around today. God's inviting you through his gift of grace and forgiveness. He's inviting you this morning to play a part in his story. And it begins, so I got three three things that I want us to, to look at specifically today. It begins with experiencing God's gift of grace and forgiveness. That's where it begins. Before we can ever share with somebody our story or share of his transforming power, we have to first experience and accept that for ourselves. So it begins with us experiencing his gift of grace and forgiveness. The first thing I want us to take away from today is that Jesus brings change. Jesus brings change to our lives. We're going to see all of this today in this story of the woman at the well. So jump down with me if you're still there. John chapter 4, verse 7 says this. So Jesus is coming, right? He passes through Samaria. The Bible says that he's really tired from his journey, so he takes a seat by this well. And in verse 7 it says this, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman, she's shocked. She's surprised. She she said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So Jesus has this encounter with this Samaritan woman, which we'll learn more about here in just a moment. But her life is about to change because of this encounter with Jesus. And that's what I want us to gather from today, is that our life, Jesus brings change, and he desires to do that through the power of the gospel, through the power of his gift of grace and forgiveness to you and me. I want you to notice a few things about the woman first uh, and foremost. So this woman actually comes at a time of the day Uh, when she would have known nobody else was going to be at the well. It was the hottest part of the day, number one. She would have known no other women, no other men, no other townspeople were going to be at the well, and she does that intentionally. She does that because she's trying to avoid any contact with the rest of the town. You know why? Because this woman, this woman had a reputation, and she was a broken woman. This woman was rejected, she was abused, she was neglected, she was used, and she was full of shame and guilt. And that shame and guilt kept her from wanting to encounter anybody else in her city. So she would come to the well at the moment when she knew nobody else was going to be there. But not today. Today she encounters Jesus, the Savior of the world. And she brings her brokenness to him. Our first sub-point under this, when Jesus brings change in our life, he's inviting you to bring your brokenness to him. 
Listen, that should be an encouragement to all of us. You know why? Because it means you don't have to fix your life before coming to Jesus. You don't have to improve your life or better yourself. In fact, that's his promise. His promise is that he will give you a new heart. He will change your life from the inside out. And so many of us, we fall under this American thinking, this this uh, misunderstanding that we've got to fix our lives before we come to Jesus. We've got to better that area of our life, that anger or that frustration or, or, or that pride in our life. We've got to fix those things before we'll ever uh, believe that God will look favorably upon us. And listen to me. Listen, you don't have to fix your life. Jesus welcomes you as you are. And he invites you in to bring about change in your life. Matthew 11, to prove that, Matthew 11 says this. Come to me. It's an invitation. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. He's saying you, you who struggle, you who carry the burdens around of unforgiveness, you who carry the burdens around of a broken relationship, you who carry that shame and that guilt, he's inviting you this morning to come to him and I will give you rest is what he says. That's his promise. Second Corinthians verse five, Paul writes and he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. Behold, the old things have passed away. New things have come. You don't have to fix your life. You come to Jesus and you ask him and you accept his gift of grace and forgiveness. Jesus, you can bring your brokenness to him. Second thing I want us to see out of this story, check this out. The gospel breaks down any perceived barriers that you might have. I think this is huge. I love this point because I want you to see a few things. These were barriers to this woman experiencing the grace of God. First of all, Jesus was a man. She was a woman. Listen, in in that day and age, that was prohibited. In fact, uh, in my studying, it it said that um, (laughs) there were many Pharisees, many of these Jewish religious elites uh, that would not even talk to their sister or their mother in public for fear of the way that it would be perceived. You, you just, as a man, especially as a Jewish teacher, you just didn't talk to a woman in public. But Jesus broke that barrier. This woman was a Samaritan woman. Jesus was a Jewish teacher. If you don't know anything about that history, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. In fact, they fought against one another on multiple occasions. You, the, the Jews looked at them as an inferior hybrid race, and it was understood that as a Jewish person, you did not associate with those people. You ever heard that before? We don't associate with those people. But Jesus broke down barriers. Jesus talked with this woman who was a Samaritan. Thirdly, I want you to see that this woman was living in unconfessed public sin. This would be the last person that a Jewish religious teacher would talk to. But here's the beauty of this. Jesus broke down barriers. And he looked beyond the fact that this was a woman. He looked beyond the fact that this was a Samaritan. He looked beyond the fact that she had public and unconfessed sin. And he saw her soul. He saw her for who he created her to be. And he desired to have a relationship with her. And he broke down barriers. That should be an encouragement to us today, church. I don't know in your mind what barriers are there. The barriers of you don't know what I've done. The barriers of I can't do this because of who I am or or the places that I've grown up. Listen, the gospel breaks those barriers. And so I don't know what's holding you back, but the Lord desires to have a relationship with you. For us, as for those of us who are believers in this room, I think this is a, a very important point. Because oftentimes we, we fall prey to this idea that we're not allowed to talk to certain people or, or we can't have a relationship with certain people or we can't share the gospel with certain people or, or, or maybe it could fall under this, we don't associate with those kinds of people. But I want you to see as a believer in Jesus Christ, the gospel breaks down barriers. <laughs> because ultimately, the gift of grace is for everyone 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 this woman 
John chapter one, a few chapters before this, he writes, he says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. Whoever believed in him and received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. Romans 10, 13 says this, for whoever, maybe you've heard it this way, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This say might. Then say, ah, you got a good chance. It says will. You and me, we're whoever's. The Bible says that the gift of grace is for anybody who believes. This was a Samaritan woman with unconfessed public sin. And yet Jesus broke all of those barriers because he knew that even she deserved the gift of grace or was undeserving, but Jesus was going to offer it to her. We even see later on when the disciples come back, they're amazed, they're shocked that that Jesus is talking uh, with this woman. They didn't quite understand it yet. They didn't understand that Jesus came to give his life for humanity, not just for the Jews or not just for the people that think and look and act like me or live where I live. Jesus came to give his life for humanity, for the lost and the hurting, for the hopeless and the distraught, for the outcast and the neglected. Jesus loves them all. You see this, Jesus loves this woman and he offers her the gift of eternal life, living water, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he continues to offer that to you and to me today. He offers us hope, but that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Jesus offers this woman hope, but, but, but she still has questions. She still doesn't fully understand. So jump with me if you're still following along with me. Jump with me to John chapter 4 verse 15 now. Jesus is talking with her and there's, there's this dialogue going on. He says, if you would have known who I am, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. And so then Jesus explains, this, the water that I give, you'll never thirst anymore. And so then we pick up in verse 15 and this is her response. So the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or have to come all the way here to draw any longer. She didn't understand. She, she was seeing, Jesus was offering her an eternal reward, an eternal fix to her issues, her spiritual issues. And all she could see it for was the temporal, the temporary fix. She didn't understand. She says, oh, I don't have to come up here and draw water anymore? Come on, I'll take that. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 you, you don't understand. Uh, so he said to her, go call your husband and come here. Okay, this is where it gets really good. Y'all ready? He says, go call your husband and come here. In verse 17, the woman answered and said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, well, you told the truth there. Well, he didn't say it just like that. He said, you've correctly said, I have no husband. <laughs> For you've had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. Yep, you told the truth. Man, what a moment, right? Can you imagine being that woman? I think this is so important, though. There's so much that we can learn from this. This is such a powerful part of the story. Because here's what I want us to see. The second point, Jesus changes our lives. But Jesus challenges. Jesus challenges. Listen, Jesus loved this woman. That, that, we've already established that, right? Nobody else would even talk to this woman. Much less, much less uh, offer her a gift. But Jesus himself is extending the gift of grace. He loved this woman. But, but notice this, this is important. He was also truthful. He was also truthful. Now, 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 now listen, I gotta make a side note here because I don't want you to, to, to hear me incorrectly. Jesus challenges, it's good to tell the truth to people, uh, but the, the, part of this is the way in which you say this, okay? Um, you know, if you go, you go tell somebody the truth, but you do it in a, a harmful or an aggressive way, it may not be received as well as uh, if you do it in a kind and a loving way, right? So, so my point is not uh, to just say whatever you want and then just justify it by saying, well, I was truthful. <laughs> no, I, and listen, don't you leave here and go share something with somebody this week and be like, well, my pastor on Sunday said I should just tell you because it was truthful. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I am saying, the point that I'm trying to make is that we shouldn't shy away from the truth. Yes, there's a way for us to share that. Yes, there's maybe a certain tact that we use when we tell the truth to people, but we don't shy away from it. Jesus was never scared of confronting people with the truth, but he always did it from a place of love. See, that's the difference. 
That's the key for you and me. Jesus truly cared about this woman and her eternal destination and her relationship with him. And he cared about her so much that he was willing to share the truth with her. He was willing to challenge her. And the truth is, oftentimes we're afraid to share the truth with people that in our lives or, or, or with somebody that we care about. But the truth of the matter is this, Jesus challenges us, and and whether you've been a Christian for 50 years, or five minutes, or five days, or five weeks, Jesus continues to challenge us. The gospel continues to challenge us every single day. It continues to uh, confront us in in the most vulnerable parts of our lives. The gospel continues to confront us in the areas that we don't like to share, uh, the areas that we like to keep private. The gospel continues to challenge us to go deeper in our relationship with Christ, to be more like him. Each time that we read his word or we gather as a community or we hear his word preached or we worship or we pray, each time we encounter God, we should be challenged by him. That's an ongoing thing. It's not, oh, this, this, this woman met Jesus, she was challenged, she overcame that challenge, the rest of her life was, uh, was she never, never, never faced challenges again. No, the Holy Spirit continues, you know why? Because we're not perfect, and we'll never be perfect. And so the Holy Spirit continues to highlight those areas in our lives that we're not honoring God, and challenges us to honor him with our lives and go deeper in our relationship with him. He's continuing to shape us each and every day. He changes our lives. He challenges us, and then we get to the bridge that connects all of this. How did we get to a point where this this city is, is experiencing this massive revival? These people, their lives are being changed. How did we get to that? The bridge that connects your salvation experience with a lost and a hurting and a helpless world is your story. It's your testimony and your willingness to share it. Read with me in John uh, uh, verse 25, same, same chapter, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 25. So Jesus is explaining to her what it means to worship, and he's explaining to her about uh, the living water. And then in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Wow. What a moment. Jesus is literally telling her, the one that you're speaking of, woman, the Messiah that's going to come, I've been talking with you face to face for the last 30 minutes, an hour, however long we've been talking to you. I am he and I'm here and I'm offering you the gift of eternal life and living water. I am he. I'm the one that you've been looking for. And all of a sudden, it hits her. She realizes it. And her life is changed. At this point, when when he says that, At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he'd been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? (laughs) Side note real quick. I thought that was really uh, pretty funny. Uh, Because they show up on the scene, and Jesus is talking with this woman, and the disciples are all like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, why why are you talking with a woman? But none of them dared to say it out loud. (laughs) None of them said out loud, Jesus, what do you think you're doing? They just thought it in there. (laughs) Okay, don't judge them, don't judge them. Okay, Uh, I wouldn't have said it out loud either. But uh, the point is, is you see here, they were like, like, Jesus, what what do you think you're doing? But none of them said it out loud. Um, But they were shocked and amazed that Jesus would be speaking with this Samaritan woman. Check this out. This This is so important. So, verse 28. So the woman left her water pot. And she went into the city and she said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and they were coming to him. Here's the third and final point. Jesus inspires. Jesus motivates. He lights a fire, a passion, and a desire in our hearts to tell someone about it. He changes our life. He challenges us to go deeper in our relationship with him. And then he inspires and motivates and lights a passion in our hearts to tell someone about it. She finally gets it. She understands that this is Jesus and notice her reaction. She is so affected by it that she has to go share it with someone. Notice what she does. Did you you catch this? In verse 28, it's, it's a little detail, but I think it's so important. Verse 28, so the woman left her water pot. She left behind the very thing that she came for. The very thing that she showed up for that day. That was her sole purpose for being there that day was to collect water. 
It represented part of her needs for the rest of the day. They needed water to cook and to clean and to wash and to drink, but she leaves the water pot behind. You know why? It's a reminder that what she left with was far greater than what she came for. What she left with. She came for water. She came to draw water out of the well, and what she left with was far greater than what she came for. Now listen, today this might be your story. I don't know what your water pot is. I don't know what you've come into this place carrying. Maybe you just showed up today uh, for the sole purpose of gathering water. Maybe you just showed up today to hear a motivational speech or hear how to improve your life. Or or maybe you just showed up today to to cross off going to church off your list of things to do as an obligation. Maybe you showed up today because your wife said, I want you to go to church with me today. And you said, all right, I'm going. I don't know why you're here today. I don't know what you came in carrying. I don't know what struggles you came in carrying that are weighing you down. The struggles of unforgiveness or lust or the struggle of jealousy or the struggle of pride. I don't know what it is that your water pot is, but but so many of us today, we need to leave our water pots in this room and we need to walk out carrying the cross of Christ daily. (laughs) This woman was so excited about the encounter she just had, she left it behind. And notice what she did. Notice what she did. It continues to get better. And she said she ran, uh, she left her water pot, she went to the city, and she said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Is this not the Christ? Who'd she go tell? The Bible doesn't say she went to go tell the people of the city. The Bible specifically, remember I told you every word is important? The Bible says that she went and told the men of the city. This is incredibly important because she told her story. She shared her story with the very people who rejected her. She goes back. She leaves the water pot behind, and she goes back, and she shared the most intimate parts of her story. Look what she says. She said, come meet a man who's told me everything that I have done. Now listen, the people of this city, they would have known the things that this woman had done. She had a certain reputation around the city. And yet, oh, this is so good, and yet she is no longer afraid to share those details in her story. Because those details that once brought her guilt and shame that the enemy wants to use to repress her, are, she's now forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what the enemy tried to use to keep her repressed and to keep her guilty and to keep her shameful, God has now turned it on its head to be used for her good and for his glory. <laughs> Listen, I want you to hear this today because I think this is applicable to so many of us. Oftentimes, we're afraid. We're afraid to share the worst parts of our story, the most intimate parts of our story. We're afraid to share those things. But I want you to hear this. Those details, those stories only serve to show the best of our God. We're so afraid to share the worst parts of our story, but they show our God and how powerful and how good and how merciful and how loving and how transforming he can be. And the enemy, what he wants to do is to keep you repressive and shameful and guilty of your past, and he doesn't want to uh, allow God to use that to bring glory to him. It shows the best of our God, his power on display to redeem our darkest sins. Lastly, we get this this really famous Bible verse. In verse 35, it says this. Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, do not say, do you not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, Jesus says, I say to you right now, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, church. This this, this was life-changing for me. As I was studying this this week, I I realized, What Jesus is saying here, all the time I've grown up and I've heard that passage and I've always thought, well, Jesus is using the fields as an illustration and as a symbol to say it's time to go harvest and all that. No, no, no. Did you remember what he said in verse 30? That at the woman's testimony, all of the men started to leave the city and go to Jesus. You know what Jesus was referencing there? He was telling his disciples, look up and look out. Do you see all the men of the city and their white robes as they walk through the fields? These people, they desire to have hope and a future. They desire to see the light of Jesus Christ and they're coming this way. The harvest is plentiful. And I want you to hear that today, church. As you walk out, I want you to take two things. I want you to understand your, your testimony 
is powerful. There is power in your story because it tells of God's power. But secondly, as we walk out of this place today, I want you to know that the harvest is plentiful. Wherever you go, there are people who are hurting, who are lost, who are in a dark place, and they desire to see the light and the hope of Jesus Christ, and you can tell them about it. And you can tell them about it. Three years ago, August 2020, I'm almost done. We're wrapping up. Uh, Three years ago, August 2020, was uh, the largest wildfire ever recorded in the United States. It was called the August Complex. It burned in Northern California. Uh, because I'm a visual person, I, I brought a picture of it. No, it's not two cockroaches uh, eating a piece of bread. Uh, but there's the, uh, <laughs> there is the uh, wildfire burning across uh, Northern California. It's called the August Complex. It burned over a million acres of forest. Massive fire. Tons of destruction. But you know what's most interesting about this wildfire? This wasn't just one wildfire, it was actually made up of 37 smaller wildfires. That as they burned, they burned and they met with each other, they converged into one giant wildfire. It wasn't just one, it was 37. What I love about this is that God is lighting that fire and that passion in our hearts. And you want to know, you want to know how to change the world? Be faithful where you are. Influence your family influence your community and as we serve and as we're faithful where we are God uses us to come together as a church to affect our community and our state and our our nation and our world so God didn't ask you to change the world he just asked you to influence your family to be faithful where you are and he's going to use each of us to magnify the impact that we could have together to magnify the impact that we could have together way more than we could ever have on our own As we uh, close out today, I want to just invite you. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, I've I've never given my life to God. I've never truly given my life to him. I still deal with shame and regret and guilt and brokenness, and I'm ready to give it all over to him. Listen, he's inviting you today to find rest in him. He's inviting you today to surrender your life to him and to repent of your sins and your shortcomings. Allow the grace and the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God to come rushing into your life and to give you hope. Maybe for you today, God is challenging you. And listen, what I want you to do, what I want to encourage you to do is lean into those challenges. Being challenged by his word, by his spirit That God is challenging you to go deeper in your relationship with Christ, to take the next step, whatever that is, to pursue him even closer, to strive to be more like him each and every day. Lean into those challenges. Trust him. And lastly, I want to invite you to do one thing this week. I want to invite you to share your story with someone this week. There is power in your story and in your testimony because it tells of God's goodness. Share with somebody as we pray here in just a moment. Ask God to open up a door or an opportunity. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's somebody at the grocery store. Would you be courageous and bold enough to share your story, to show the power of God on full display through the redemption of our darkest moments? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather and just to worship together. I thank you for this church for each and every life and soul that's seated around this room. And I pray for each of us this morning, God. I pray for those of us in this room that have never fully surrendered our life to you. God, I pray uh, that we would stop running, that we would surrender and submit ourselves to you, that we would repent of our sins and that we would trust you with our life. I pray for those in this room, God, each of us, no matter where we are on our spiritual journey, you continue to challenge us to uh, challenge us to go deeper in our relationship with you, to pursue you even more. And I pray that we would lean into those challenges. Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room that we would be bold and courageous this week to share our story with somebody, to tell of the testimony of what you've done in our lives, to tell and cry of your goodness and your power and your mercy and your love. I pray that you would provide us with opportunities, that you would open our eyes to see those opportunities and that you would uh, open our hearts to seize those opportunities. Lord, ultimately, I pray that our lives would be a representation of you, that we would seek to live for you and you alone and to bring honor and glory to you, for you are so worthy.
and deserving of our praise and glory. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Thank you for joining us for our broadcast. This is so important. If you have never placed your faith in Christ, or you're not sure you have, I want to invite you to take this incredibly important step today. If you want to know how, do this. Find the link, bearcreek.church forward slash hope. It's bearcreek.church forward slash hope. Or text the word, just one word, BC Hope. It's BC Hope to 84576. And in about two minutes, I walk you through how to place your faith in Christ as the leader of your life. Honestly, it could be the most important two minutes of your life. Also, let me invite you to join us any Sunday in one of our four morning worship services. Check out our website, bearcreek.church, to find out more about our times and locations. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you soon.